quick way of a, a personal story from this morning. So last night I'm at work, I'm four at work on the fire department, and they sent my rig out to a wildland fire out in Burbank. And at the last minute, someone, and I had already arranged for my friend Carlos to come teach, and then at the last minute, someone from another station called me and said, hey, I'll, I'll jump on that, I want to go. So I was able to stay, I was all excited, I told Carlos, don't worry about it, I'm, I'm back on teach my people. And then this morning, I woke up and they hadn't hired for my spot. And so they said, you're stuck here. And so until 8.15, I didn't think I was coming this morning, but then the Lord made a way, they let me come, and I had to go right back. So, well, I'm here, guys! Yeah. 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 Well, let me pray, and then we're going to open up a new series today on the book of Colossians. After I pray, if you want to turn to Colossians 1, that's where we're going to be. So let's do this. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank, you, uh, I thank you that you've given us everything that we need for life and godliness, and that those aren't words, that there's just a huge, a huge pool of resources that come behind that. You back up your words, that you gave us Jesus, that you gave us um, just sunsets to look at that, that remind us that you're real. You gave us the Holy Spirit that empowers us and transforms us from the inside out. You gave us each other, and you gave us the Word of God that is active, that when we read it, always has the potential to transform us, encourage us, and renew us. So I got to just pray this morning as we dig into your Word, that all of these things would come together and that we walk out of here different. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the book of Colossians is a cool letter. It's only four chapters long. Colossians is a letter that Paul wrote when he was in prison. But I would just frame it like this. For the next 12 weeks, we're going to be looking at these four chapters that make up this whole letter. Um, and so what I would like to frame this 12-week series in is this. Think of it like this. We're going to be looking at this really, really powerful letter that Paul writes. But this letter is written in an even bigger and radical story context. And so I just want to frame it a little bit for you guys, that you guys, there's this guy that came, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, his name was Jesus. And he came from heaven to earth, he lived for 30 years as a carpenter, and as a son, and as a brother, as a Jewish man, and then he started his earthly ministry. And during his ministry that lasted about two and a half years, to three and a half years, he performed miracles and he claimed that he was God. And this stirred up great controversy and excitement and all kinds of emotion. And at the end of that time, the Romans, by, by way of uh, accusation from his Jewish leaders, the Romans crucify him on a cross. He dies. He claimed that what he was dying for was for our sins. When they were all trying to figure out what that meant. He's dead all day Saturday. Sunday morning, some of his followers go to the grave and he's risen from the dead. He's not there. The guys take off. The girls kind of hang out. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in this resurrected body. And he, and he, and he says, I want you to go tell the, the brothers what you've seen. From that time, all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and now he has a resurrected body. The Bible says that for 40 days, he's walking amongst them. In 1 Corinthians, it says that at one point, there were over 500 witnesses that witnessed Jesus risen from the dead. So we know it wasn't a drug hallucination. I mean, you can't get 500 people to agree on anything. And they all saw him. He does this for 40 days, it says, and then he publicly, people witnessed him ascending to heaven. We don't know what that looked like, but he ascended to heaven. He said, before he left, that when, I, when I, that I'm coming back, there's going to be this second coming. He gives them instruction. He says... Go to Jerusalem and wait and pray. They go there and they wait and they pray. He dies during Passover, 50 days after Pen Passover, a Jewish feast is Pentecost. On Pentecost, they wake up in the morning, the walls start shaking, and something happens. The Holy Spirit comes on these people, and all of a sudden this revolution starts that we know as the church. It happens in Jerusalem, things are happening, Men and women are both preaching the gospel in Jerusalem in all of these different languages so that everyone understands it. 
Peter gets up and he shares this, what's going on, he, he, he explains it, thousands of people are getting saved, from that time on it says, daily people are getting saved, lots of people are getting saved, it's all contained in Jerusalem. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see this from Acts 2 through Acts 7. All of a sudden, this is becoming this big kind of deal in Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders and the Romans kind of to team up together and they start persecuting this church. They want to stop it. You look in Acts chapter 8, what happens is this causes the church to start leaving. A lot of the leaders start dispersing. They're running for their lives. Well, where they end up going is all over the world. Acts chapter 8, we see the first missionary, Philip, goes and preaches to the Samaritans and he's preaching the gospel to them. Lots of them are getting saved. It's going there. Acts chapter, if you'd imagine, at this point, you're trying to contain it as the Jewish leaders. It's spreading out all over. Then they come up with this plan. Let's start sending our representatives out to go follow these people and put an end to it before it spreads too much. One of the key people that's doing that is named Saul. He gets letters. He starts traveling to where these, these Christians are going, bringing this gospel, and his mission was to stop them by, by any means. While he's on the road, while he's on his road trip, Jesus visits him. An audible voice. He hears Jesus' voice. says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You can read all about this in Acts chapter 9. All of a sudden, he has this new mission. He was out to persecute and stop these people. His new mission is to join them and spread the gospel to the Gentiles. So he's spreading it all over the place. You read the rest of Acts. It's about Paul's three missionary journeys all over the world. By the time you get to Acts chapter 19, he's in, uh, he's in Ephesus. It's his third missionary journey that we know of, and he's in prison. And he had to be thinking, like, this is crazy. All I want to do is go all over the place. So many people don't want to do anything, and all I want to do is go all over the place. I'm stuck in this prison. But he doesn't have that attitude. He realizes what a blessing this is. Because Ephesus is a city where all kinds of people come for business. And all these people are traveling to Ephesus, and he's getting to spread the gospel with, to them, and then they go back and take the gospel with them. So it's still spread. Can't stop it. One of the guys who goes is this guy named Epaphras. You guys ever heard of him? He's from a city called Colossae. You guys have heard of that, right? So Colossae is this city. It's about 100 miles inland from Ephesus. You go another 100 miles, there's this city called Antioch. You can hear about those. Those are big cities. Right in the middle is Colossae. At one point, it had been this thriving textile industry. Huge business. Made, made uh, a clothes. They actually have a color of red that's Colossian red, named after that. This was a couple hundred years before Jesus and Paul. But then they started planting new cities uh, like uh, Laodicea and a couple of other ones. They became the booming, booming cities. By the time Paul is there, this city is now kind of run down. It's like Detroit. It's a used-to-be area. It used to be a booming area. Now it's kind of, there's still people there. But a lot of it's run down. This guy, Epaphras, comes from Colossae. He goes to Ephesus on a business trip one day. And little did he know, he didn't know that on his business trip, he, he meets Paul. Paul preaches the gospel to him. He gets saved. He goes back to his hometown from his business trip, starts telling people what Paul told him. People start getting saved. Before you know it, a church is planted. And this church is planted in Colossae from Epaphras, who heard it from Paul. It's Lots of great things are happening, and then it starts to have some trouble. So Epaphras decides, I don't know what to do anymore. As leading this, what do I do? I'll go talk to Paul. He goes back to Ephesus, talks to Paul. Paul writes a letter in response to that. That's what we have as Colossians. It's a powerful story in the context of a really radical story. So let's begin our journey in Colossians chapter 1, just verses 1 through 8 today. The next 12 weeks, we're going to make it all the way through it, and we'll build on all of this stuff. It says this. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, Grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you 
as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it always does, and as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So it almost sounds like a standard greeting, right? It is far from a standard greeting. It is a personal letter from Paul and Timothy to this small little church that Paul had never even been to. And only, it didn't even, it wasn't even founded by any great pastor. It wasn't founded by Peter, wasn't founded by John, wasn't founded by any of those, wasn't founded by Paul. It was founded by Epaphras, who we all admitted we never even heard of him. Epaphras plants this church, right? And this is a beautiful thing. Now, Paul is writing this letter. This is a city that was very small, usually overlooked. It was a has-been city. I mean, you don't really write to your friends back home. I live in California. Oh, yeah, what city? I live in Barstow, right? No one's excited about Barstow. If you're from Barstow, we are him, right? That's, that's what you, you travel through. Colossae was like that. And they were just a small church with some struggle. Do you think they ever felt like we're not that important or we're not as important as some of the thriving big churches? We don't have a big church pastor name. We don't have all these resources. They probably were feeling like that. And they started having some problems arguing with each other. Now Epaphras is going, trying to figure out what to do. And then they're like kind of just in waiting. I imagine they probably felt small. And so to get this letter... The first thing in your notes is this. This letter would have hit them like this. You're not alone! You're not alone! To give it some context, imagine us, Little Remembrance Community Church in the middle of Lameda. Imagine if I showed up next week and I said, Hey guys, no big deal, NPD. It's got a letter over the week from, um, from Billy Graham, and I'm going to read it to you. Dear Remembrance Community Church, uh, from Billy Graham, I've heard of your little church in Lomita called Remembrance Community Church. Kenny told me about it. And I just want to say, uh, the things that I'm hearing, I'm super excited. Three people are getting baptized next week. That's so encouraging, right? Imagine if that happened. That would be amazing, right? Like Billy Graham, no way. Great Lord, one of these guys. This is what it would have felt like for this small little church to get a letter from Paul and Timothy. Now we learned three important things that I think are very relevant to us in the context of this letter that says, you're not alone, small little Colossae. You're not alone. We learned that we have many great leaders to learn from. No matter what church you're in, how small it is, how big it is, there are many leaders for us to learn from. In this context, he goes, hey, this is Paul and this is Timothy. You have Epaphras, he's great. But this is Paul and Timothy. There's many great leaders for you to learn from. In our day, that's true more than ever. There are so many great books that you can read, and I would encourage you to read. I was going to bring seven that I had picked out, but I didn't have time between going from a fire service and barely getting here. So I just picked out two that were at my house that I want to commend to you. The first one I'm, I'm going to tell you is not, I don't have a, a copy here, but it's, it's if you're married or thinking about getting married, you should read a book by Tim Keller that's called The Meaning of Marriage. The Meaning of Marriage goes through the book of Ephesians and it talks about God's purpose for marriage. It is such a great context to understand how God designed marriage, what its purpose is. It is a wonderful book by Tim Keller. If you have little kids, Get the Jesus Storybook Bible. Get the Jesus Storybook Bible. Here's the thing about you read it first and then read it to your kids. It will minister to you. There's lots of children's study Bibles out there, but this one's like Pixar. You know what Pixar, what's great about Pixar? Pixar makes movies that are for kids that adults can enjoy. The Jesus Storybook Bible is brilliant. Read that. It ministers to three-year-olds and 42-year-olds. Right? It's wonderful. If you have kids a little bit older, you have got to get this book, The TechWise Family from Abby Crouch. This book talks about all of the technology, all of the phones and apps and all of those things. And what I love about it is it's not a book called I Kiss Technology Goodbye. 
That would be foolish. But it's about how to have wisdom in the context that we actually live in where technology is around us all the time. You can't avoid it. The tech-wise family. If you, uh, if you want another book suggestion, you could ask me about any subject. I'll give you a book. Right? But here's one more, an old one, a classic by A.W. Tozer, The Knowledge of the Holy. He's not even around anymore, but he left us this writing to look at the attributes of God. This is a wonderful book that we can read. You can, you can read blogs. You can uh, listen to podcasts. You can listen to sermons. Right? There's so many great resources. There are so many great leaders that we can all learn from. Isn't that wonderful? So Paul reminds them of stuff like that. Hey, you guys aren't alone. You got a papyrus, he came. I'm giving you back some instruction. You guys aren't alone. There's a lot of great wisdom out there. Letter B is this. That we're a part of a network of saints around the globe. He says, you, one of the things I love about you and I've heard about you guys is that you love all the saints. Here's what, I, here's, here's what I love. God has not called Remembrance Community Church to be the best church in the South Bay. We haven't been called to be the church. We've just been called to be faithful with what God's called us to do. I'm proud to tell you that there are a lot of great churches in the South Bay and beyond. Some of my, 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 my friend, uh, Pastor Mike at Gates Harbor Church, the new pastor there, God, he's a wonderful guy. I love hanging out with him. So many pastors around. I came from Hope Chapel many years ago with, with, with Pastor Zach. I mean, there's still things that every once in a while I'll just repeat some of his zingers. You have these zingers, like give them heaven or all these things, right? He's just, we have, we're a part of something here. How many of you guys know that there's more churches in the South Bay than this one, right? That should encourage us. How many of you guys know other Christians who go to other churches? It's awesome. We get to hear about what God's doing. What's God doing? Oh, cool. This is what God's doing. This is kind of what we're struggling with right now. How'd you guys deal with that? When we went to... It's great to be a part of something bigger. And we, in fact, are. And we should celebrate that. Paul talks about that. And then letter C, it's healthy to be a part of a local church that you can do life with. Paul, Paul refers to them as, they, this is the letter specifically to faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. He says, I'm writing this letter to you. And he says, in fact, after you read it, send it over to Laodicea and have them read it, he says in chapter 4. Right? But it's to the specific church. It's good to be a part of a specific church because in this context, we actually know each other. We can help each other. We can encourage each other. We can hold each other accountable. We can see what's going on and maybe what our next steps would be. We can say, hey, go to the mentor tree. Right? We can do those things Together, we can get in a small group. And so it's good to have all of this context. But in the big, in the, in the big seed that I want you guys to get is, hey, you are a part of something wonderful and powerful. You are a part of God's bride. You are a part of the church. When things happen like are happening in Texas right now, we can send resources to churches that are on the ground right there ready to serve because we are a part of a network of Churches all around the globe. Isn't that wonderful? Now, the next thing in your notes that we learn from this passage is that you are called to be disciples. You're called to be disciples. And I'm calling our, 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 our teaching today to be and make disciples. Our mission statement, and we're still working on some of the, 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 the wording on it, but, but I would say our mission statement is this. What gets me up in the morning to come here is this. We exist to passionately point people to Jesus. I don't have all the answers. I want to point people to Jesus. I don't want people to point to me. I want them to point to Jesus. We want to passionately point people to Jesus. We believe that if anybody got a real glimpse of who Jesus is, the Jesus that we know, it would be changed forever. We just want to passionately point people to Jesus and teach them to be and make disciples. You know who makes healthy disciples? Healthy disciples make healthy disciples. It's important that we would be a disciple first. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. I've heard about the seed that, of the gospel that's come to you, and it's spreading and it's growing in you guys, and I'm excited about it. You guys are being disciples first. And here's three things that he says are characteristic that they should be focused on, that he hears are going well with them. Before we get to those three things, I just want to stop and think about this in your own life. 
what are the what are the what are the, the improvements in your life that you pursue? Do they sound like this? Success, productivity, to be happy. Those are things that we pursue, that we chase after, that we go to conferences, that we try to develop skills for. Those aren't the things that Paul talks about. Maybe those things are good in their place, but there's three things that are more important according to Paul and throughout the New Testament. And the first one he says about them is this. I heard about you, that you have genuine faith. A genuine faith is something to pursue, to develop. And faith in the Bible is more than just a, a, a list of things that you say you believe. Faith is what you put into practice. Faith is when you believe something enough to put it into practice. Now you're living by faith. Not just what you believe, but when you put it into practice. So he says, you guys, I've heard about you guys. You guys have genuine faith. That's awesome. Very good. He's going to get to some things that they need to work on. But before he does that, he's like, here's what's going good, you guys. I hear you guys have genuine faith. That's huge. And then letter B, he says, I heard you guys love the church. He says, I heard about the love that you have for all of the saints. Now here's something to think about. When you look at the Bible, the Bible really wraps the context of love into three main categories. It wants you to love God, right? Love God. It wants you to love the lost. Love those who haven't yet met Jesus and turned their life over to Him. Love the lost. And He wants you to love the church. I would ask this question, and it's not a right or wrong question. This is just a kind of a thought provoke. Maybe we'll have different honest answers. Which one of those is the hardest for you? Is it the hardest for you to love God? Is it the hardest for you to love the church? Or is it the hardest for you to love those who are lost? For me, and I'm honest, it's hardest for me to love the church. Because, you know, you look on Facebook and you see people fighting with each other and you see the things that people are doing and the bad examples. And it's easy to get disgruntled and talk bad about the church. I left the church or I don't, I, you know, no. He specifically says this about them. I heard how much you love the church. How many of you guys, if you're married and somebody was um, saying negative things about your wife, you'd be cool with that? How do you think Jesus feels when people talk negatively about his wife, the bride, the church? When you put it in that context, it's important for us to love the church. Not that they do everything right. So we're supposed to love God. We're supposed to love the lost. We're supposed to love the church, no matter how frustrating our brothers and sisters can be, right? Just like in real life. So you love the church. And then letter C is you hold fast to hope. So faith, hope, and love, all throughout the New Testament, and whoever read the book of Hebrews talks about this. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter. Paul talks about it in many of his letters. I want to just bring up a couple of those. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you've ever been to a wedding, that's the love chapter. Love is patient, love is kind. And it goes on, right? And then it gets to chapter, uh, verse 11, and Paul says this in this context. He says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love. But one more thing in this text in 1 Corinthians 13. Most of the time in, in current history, when we talk about the church, whether it's good or bad, we like to gauge how authentic it is, right? That's the big, that's the buzzword. Oh, I love that church. It's super authentic. I don't know about that church. It's a little fake, right? A little, it's a little soft on theology, or they're very clicky, or whatever it is, right? They're, that's we, we based on how much we think it's real and authentic. Paul doesn't really use that gauge very often. More often, what Paul uses as a gauge is how mature you are. Maturity 
is the way that he gauged your discipleship and the churches. How mature are you? And I would say that when you're a brand new Christian, you should be immature, right? Like when you're, when you're a child, you act like a child, but then he says, when I grew up, I put childish things away. So the idea that Paul is saying that what we should be pursuing as followers is to grow in our faith, in our hope, and in our love. How are you doing with your faith, hope, and love? That's an important thing for us to look at. And I would submit this. Sometimes the best way to see how you're doing is to look at the opposite and maybe see if you have any of those tendencies. So with faith, would you say in your life, your life is marked by these things? I like to play it safe. I like to avoid unnecessary risk. And I like to maintain my personal comfortability. Is comfort the big deal? I don't want to do that. That would be uncomfortable. I don't want to do it. It doesn't feel safe. I don't want to do it. I don't want to take that risk. It's not worth it to me. Now, I would submit that sometimes there's wisdom that we should use, and safety is a good thing, right? We teach that to our kids. And avoiding unnecessary risk can sometimes be a good thing. And it's not wrong to always be comfortable. It's not like God says, hey, my goal for you is to be as uncomfortable as as if that's what I love, right? No, he's not like that. But I would ask you this. If God somehow, during worship or during my sermon or during whatever, was able to speak to your heart, to your mind, and he just kind of revealed to you, this is what I want you to do next. Are you ready? Are you ready? Is that your posture? God, you tell me what you want me to do because I'm ready to do it. Or you go like, well, what is it? <laughs> tell me what it is first, right? Let me weigh that out, right? Living my faith is being ready to do whatever he calls you to do, whenever he calls you to do it, no matter what. And love, love. Do you like to be right? I mean, how many of you guys have ever been in a conversation and then before long you realize, I'm no longer trying to convince you, I'm just trying to convince you that I'm right. Right? I'm just trying to win. I love to win. I'm very competitive. And love, when it gets competitive, can get really messy and people can be getting, you, can, you, you wanna, how many of you guys just wanna get your way? I love to get my way, right? And how many of you guys, how many of you guys, um, feel like i got to look out for my own interest because nobody else will if I don't look out for my own interest. These things can get in the way of loving others when we focus on them too much. How are you doing with your genuine love for others? And then hope. How many of you guys ever feel like this? I want it now. I mean, I have Amazon Prime because you know why? Because I love books and I cannot wait three days. That's ridiculous. Two days is my max. Because I want it now, right? That's how we live in this context. I want it now. I, I, I don't want to wait. Immediate gratification. And then we mix these things together. And then some of you guys will go like, okay, God, I heard that. My next step is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. God, tell me what you want me to do today, and I will do it. And then nothing. <coughs> then you're going to leave and go, oh, I tried. Right? No, you got to wait in hope, and keep asking. All of these things have to work together. Keep loving, not because they're not hurting you or because they're doing all the right things or because their posts are beautiful, but because it's Jesus' bride and he wants you to love them. And he wants you to love the lost. And he wants you to love him. And he wants you to be ready to do whatever he calls you to do. And a lot of the time, that is in hope. But we don't wait with this empty hope, like, I hope that tomorrow is less humid than today. <coughs> that's a, a hope that makes a lot of sense, and that's a type of hope, but that is not the type of hope that we have. We have the hope like this, like, Jesus is coming back. Like he says in 1 Corinthians, now we see our relationship with God's kind of like a dim mirror or a foggy mirror, but one day we will see him face to face. It will happen. 
That's, that's a solid hope. It's about waiting and living in this context and growing in this context. And then the last thing in your notes is this. After we're called to be disciples, we are called to make disciples. Before Jesus ascended, it tells us in Matthew 28 that he gave us some clear instructions. He said, go make disciples. Dallas Willard called it the great omission because we're not doing it as a church in general. But Jesus said, go make disciples. So I want to show you a quick video and then we'll jump back into our notes. When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Simon Says. Right? Most of us have played that unless you're really young because there's no app for it. Is Simon Says is, uh, you know, you just, Simon Says, pat your head, you know, so, okay, you know, Simon said it. Um, it's just, it was a very simple game, but it's so weird how in the church, Jesus Says is a totally different game. If Jesus says something, you don't have to do it, you just have to memorize it. You, 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 you study it, you memorize it. You guys, it, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of things we do. He tells us to go out and make disciples, and how many people in the churches are actually making disciples? They memorized it. You know, when I tell my daughter, hey, hey Rach, go clean your room, she doesn't come back to me two hours later and go, I memorized what you said. <laughs> he says, Rach, go clean your room. I can say it in Greek. <laughs> My friends are going to come over and we're going to have a study of what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> she knows better than that. And so why do we think we're going to come before the judge one day and quote everything that he said? And talk about how much we know. But it's just, it's just this black and white stuff. If I just start with scripture, I'd go, here's what I would do. i would start making disciples. So Francis Chan is another great leader we can learn from. He has a gift of making you feel foolish and then feel good about it, right? That's a real gift. But, but he says we need to make disciples. That's exactly what Jesus says. And he makes it kind of plain, like, why are we not doing it? And I would submit that there's a couple of reasons, and there's probably a spectrum of reasons. Sometimes it's, we're so caught up in doing our own thing that we just don't make it a priority. But there's also the very real piece, and I think probably the more more, more mainstream piece that we don't feel confident about it. We don't feel like we know what to do. We don't know what that would look like for us. And so, what I'm about to share with you in this letter, I hope is incredibly encouraging. Because what we see in this letter is a picture of what it looks like to make disciples in real life for real people like blue-collar Christians. <laughs> you have this guy, Epaphras. Epaphras is just in the textile industry, we imagine. He's just a businessman. He's not even a Christian yet. He's probably a Gentile. And he goes on a business trip. Any of you guys ever been on a business trip before? Right? You go on a business. And if you even if you work somewhere and your boss was like, hey, go get me coffee. Boom, business trip. Write it off. Right? I'm talking about anything like that. Or how many of you guys are like, I can't do ministry. I I'm just too busy because I got soccer every Saturday. Are there people there? Maybe that's your mission field, right? You, you do all of these things. How many of you guys during your week are ever around people? <laughs> How many of you guys ever eat? Well, imagine you've got to go to the grocery store. Imagine you might go out to a restaurant. If you're like, right? You, we're around people all the time. And so what we see in this story, when it comes to making disciples, that we need to be like Epaphras. You do not need to be like Paul. You do not need to be like Peter. It is a wonderful thing to be like a Epaphras and just do ordinary things with gospel intentionality. Ready. God might lead you to someone today. And are you ready? Are you willing? I had that happen this morning to me. I was making phone calls trying to get my chief to let me come here to preach to you guys. And I was all kind of like distraught and trying to figure it out, and nervous and praying and all these, a whole spectrum, right, of good emotions and bad actions. 
all matched up into one, right? Like good thoughts and bad thoughts coming together, colliding. And then one of the guys that was working with me he goes like this. He goes, hey, I heard you're trying to go teach at your church. I don't go to church anymore. You just like drop that ball. I don't go to church anymore. So I'm like, oh yeah, well, I stop everything. Oh, tell me more about that. He goes, yeah, I was a pastor's kid. Matter of fact, my dad was a missionary and now he's a pastor. And I said, well, what happened? He starts telling me why he doesn't have hope anymore, why he doesn't believe. Guess what I got the opportunity to say? I hear you, man. I, 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 I think some of those same things have been a struggle for myself, and here's how I've got beyond those. God's sending me back there. I'd rather go to my family, but God's sending me back there to go to work. Guess what? I'm going to have 17 hours with me. You only get an hour and a half. You have to put up with me. He's going to have to put up with me for the next 17 hours. And because... That's the way God works when you just do ordinary things with gospel intentionality. And the letter B is, and we'll have the worship team come back up, is this. What you need to do is you need to share the hope that you have. The Bible tells us that. 1 Peter tells us that. In 1 Peter chapter 3, he says this. He says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you, for a reason for the hope that is in you. That's what you need to do. Always be ready to give an answer, a reason for the hope that you have. And then he gives you some good advice. He says, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile you, your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. He's like, hey, just be ready to share the gospel with you. And then at the end he goes, and do it with gentleness and respect. And then at the end of that he goes, and sometimes it's not going to work. Just be ready. Just share the hope that you have. Sometimes people aren't going to be convinced and they're going to make fun of you. Don't worry about it. Just be ready to share the hope you have. What's your job? To convince people? No, just to be ready to share the hope you have. Are you going to have to like rent out an auditorium? Or are you going to have to call all your friends over to your house and go, we're going to have a Gospel Wednesday night, right? And then we're going to capture it all on. No, he's just saying like ordinary things with ordinary people and just be ready. And every once in a while, someone might go, hey, I heard you're a Christian. Don't go, oh yeah, but I'm not like all those other Christians that I don't like, right? No, just be like, yeah, I am a Christian, right? And they might go to you like this. I'm not a Christian anymore. Like, oh, that is so profound, right? This, I didn't take an apologetics class for this morning. I was just like, it just kind of stumbled upon me and I just, I noticed it. I said, and I wasn't ready. I, was like, I just noticed it. I go, oh, this is an opportunity that God's bringing. I do not want to miss this. Always be ready to just share the hope that you have. That's powerful. And then let her see, this is so beautiful. Is this. The gospel is life-changing. The gospel is life-changing. Here's why this is powerful. Listen. Get up. You do not have to be great at convincing people that Jesus is real and that you should follow Him. You do not need to be great at convincing people that Jesus is real and they should follow Him. Why? Because the Gospel is powerful. The spread of the Gospel was not happening because the greatest salesman in the world became Christian. It was fishermen and apathesis. And the gospel was powerful. How many of you guys, even if you're a horrible salesman, if I gave you a product that was life-changing, that would change everybody's life, and you were going to go door to door and say, here's this product that will change your life, and it's free. How many of you guys think you can sell a couple of those? Because the gospel is powerful, is what he's saying. And not only that, he says, I want you to have faith, hope, and love. You are not alone. You have all these resources. You are not alone. I just want you to focus on these things. Have faith. Be ready. Be ready for now. Be waiting for the future and have love during the whole time. That's your call. And you do not need to muster that up on your own. Pull out your Bibles one more time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What does it say in the last part in chapter 8? It goes, and, and I, he's made this known to us your love. What does it say after that? In the Spirit. What he's saying is, 
He's saying that you guys got the gospel. Patrick's got the gospel. Jesus came into his life. The Holy Spirit came into his life. The Holy Spirit was working in him, brought him back. He was just kind of telling people the hope that he had just found. It actually was taking root, which was shocking, right? And then the Holy Spirit was going in them. Now the Holy Spirit is stirring up in this church. The Holy Spirit is stirring up faith and hope and love. And that's what I noticed. That's what I heard is that the Holy Spirit is working just like we knew it would. Rejoice! And as we prepare to worship, one more thing in this letter, Paul's writing from prison. And he doesn't write a letter telling him about all of his woes. He doesn't write a post about what the president's doing, whether he likes it or not. He writes a letter to this small little church. He says, I heard about you guys. I'm excited about what God's doing in you. I'm going to give you some instruction that I think will be helpful in these coming chapters, but for now, I'm thankful. And here's what we learn from Paul who's in prison. We learn this, that when you're mature as a Christian, you don't wait until you feel thankful. You choose to feel thankful. How many of you guys are willing to choose to stand to your feet and to praise Jesus because he's wonderful? Let's do that.